Hello and welcome to this webinar on Farm Business Planning for Environmental Markets, delivered as part of the Selby and Doncaster Catchment Project funded by Yorkshire Water. I'm Laura Harpen and I'll be hosting today. We are very fortunate to have some expert speakers with us this morning, Paul Spate, Amelia Rome, Amanda Cornfall smith and Graham Dixie, who isn't on the screen at the moment, but uh, will be joining us a little later. I'll let them introduce themselves a little bit more fully as part of their sections. As you can hopefully see from the agenda on this slide, after this welcome from me, I'll hand over to Paul to do a brief introduction to the project and its activity in the area. And then we'll hear from Amelia on incorporating environmental grants and nature markets into farm business planning. As you may have seen from announcements from DEFRA in the last couple of days, it's an exciting time. In addition to SFI, there is lots of other support available as we go through agricultural transitions. So um, although, I don't want to steal any thunder. There's a lot uh, out there and sometimes it can be a bit challenging to actually uh, get a hold of what's the best option for you. Hopefully this webinar will cover some of those and at least give you an overview of what you could be considering. Uh, in terms of getting support for that kind of thing, Amanda will also give us a summary of uh, some of the support and professional advice offered by the Future Farming Resilience Fund. And hopefully if Brian's able to join us, he will round off with a review of the farming rules for water. So the um, legislative underlining rules, uh, which all farmers and land managers need to be uh, observing in order to protect our water quality. So we should hopefully have time at the end to address any questions that are raised. Um, and I'll do my best not to keep anyone from their lunch, but also cover as much as we can in what's likely to be a fairly action packed session. Just to let you know, as you joined, you should have had a notification that we're recording the session to share after the event. If you have any questions for our speakers, please do submit them in the Q&A option. You should have that button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'll keep an eye on these and either raise them to individual speakers as we go along or pick them up at the end, depending on uh, what's the best approach. And so without further ado, I will ask Paul to share his screen. If you will, please, Paul, and introduce himself so we can get started. Thank you. Okay, hopefully you can see that. We can indeed, thank you. Excellent, okay. Uh, good morning, uh, my name is Paul Spate. Uh, I'm a hydrogeologist with Yorkshire Water. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to uh, give a, a quite a, a brief introduction to the project that we're running currently in the Selby and Doncaster area. And essentially we're, we're um, looking at uh, and investigating uh, elevated uh, nitrate and uh, certain uh, pesticide uh, concentrations in the groundwater that affect some of our abstraction. Um, so hopefully we'll move on. Maybe not, yes it is. Um, hopefully you can see the screen updated there. Uh, so starting with a sort of a, a, a very um, zoomed out overview, uh, this is a geological map of the north of England and the bit that we're interested in, I don't know if you'll be able to see my pointer. I'm not sure actually, can you see the pointer? We can, yeah, thanks oh, for great. That's that's that. That. <laughs> um, yes, so the, the, the pink uh, shaded area that runs down the, the, the sort of spine of Yorkshire, as it were, uh, from Middlesbrough, more or less, down to, to Nottingham, is the Sherwood Townsend Aquifer. And this is a very important aquifer in the north of England. Um, it's quite old. It's 200, 250 million years old, Triassic rocks. Um, and uh, the thickness is sort of two to 300 metres, typically. Um, we've got boreholes that are in excess of 200 metres into this aquifer. And so... Zooming in now, um, we can see the Selby and Doncaster well fields. And these are uh, the, the sort of big purple shaded areas are the, the what's um, referred to as the total catchment. So what that means is that um, rain falling in this area will ultimately be uh, abstracted or some of it will be abstracted from our boreholes. And that's not to say that all of the, the rain that falls in this area is abstracted in our boreholes, it just means that the water we abstract has come from this area. And uh, to give you a sense of the, of the, the, the quantities that we're talking about, um, Selby Wellfield, the northern one, has um, seven sources and abstracts about 44 megalitres per day. And Doncaster, 11 sources 
about 66. So it's, so it's 110 megalitres per day, and a megalitre is 1,000 tonnes. So it's 110,000 tonnes on a typical day of water being extracted um, from this area, from the, this aquifer. And the aquifer itself is a sandstone aquifer, and we characterise it as a high storage aquifer. And what that means is you've got a lot of water that moves quite slowly. And that uh, is why you've got these little bullseyes um, uh, around the abstractions. On, on the map, you've got those uh, green and red uh, bits. And so whilst the, the total catchments are very large, I mean, these are big land areas we're talking about, about um, the, the inner catchment areas are defined by travel time. And because the water moves quite slowly, the green, the green one is um, uh, 400 days from the edge to the centre, as it were. Um, so it's about a year to get that water across that area. So it gives you a, a sense of how long it takes uh, for the water to move through the, through the ground. And the red, the red areas, the other catchments are uh, the same, but the 50 days travel time. And this is sort of the same, the same map again, um, uh, looking slightly different, this time looking at the surface water uh, distribution. And the point really here is um, to, to compare, certainly for the Doncaster um, well field, the east to the west of, of that. When you look at the west side, um, the, the rivers have a very sort of naturalistic appearance. They, you've got springs that feed into small rivers that feed into to larger rivers and so on. Um, when you move across the catchment and look at the, the, the east side, um, then the rivers, they're, they're very straight, um, they're laid out in a grid pattern, they're clearly man-made. This is a, a, a drained landscape. And the point for us when we're thinking about how these catchments are operating um, is that we would not expect to get very much uh, recharge into the aquifer in that area. So there's not much water uh, going from the land down into the aquifer um, in the east side of the catchment. Um, so we're looking much more in the, in the west side, the point of it's kind of this area here. Um, the, the Selby one is much more straightforward. We don't have like, this, this um, difference in, in the, uh, the, the geology in the same way. And when I mentioned the geology, just looking at, again at that map, but superimposing the geology on it. Um, unfortunately, the, 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 the the sandstone was the pink part on the on the previous geological map. This is a different geological map, and now the, the sandstone is the, the yellow orange part. So apologies for that. Um, but yes, yeah, so you can see that the, the, the well field sits squarely on the on the sandstone um, uh, outcrop. But when we get to the, the east of that, we've got a mudstone. And this coincides with this little drained landscape. Um, we've also got quite a lot of um, uh, impermeable superficial clays and that sort of thing sitting on top of the solid geology in the eastern side. And so, as I say, we're not, we're not expecting to get very much water in. Um, and all of this, all of this, this um, information is, is used to try and understand how these factors are operating. So I mentioned nitrate. Um, this is looking very much at the, the, the nitrate distribution, the high nitrate sources um, that, that we have. And the interesting thing here is that um, it, it only affects certain sources. It doesn't affect all of them in the same way. And when you look at the catchments, you think, well, they all look the same. They're all about the same size. The land use is pretty much indistinguishable. Um, so there's other things going on um, that creates the, the high nitrate in some of the, the abstractions, but not in others. Uh, we think it's to do with the geology and, and the, the route that the groundwater takes through the, the, the aquifer and uh, essentially how much oxygen remains in the water. But it just points to, again to the complexity um, of the catchments and um, how you can't make assumptions. You have to go and look and uh, try and work out what's going on. So we have what are called safeguard terms designated. And these are designated by the Environment Agency. Um, and what they mean is that they're always designated for a particular um, substance. In this case, we're talking about nitrate. Um, and they uh, enable, in fact, they require us to, to, to go and uh, do work, so to investigate what's going on, to try and identify um, where the problem's coming from, and ultimately to try and um, do something about it. And so 
yeah, when we look at that, that's that's the same thing, but for pesticides. And as you can see, that the the again, it's it, we've got designations for for some of the sources, but not for others. And we've actually got one down in the south there that's designated for both. So, and I should say actually, the current the current project, what the, the reason that we're, we're all here today is as a result of that designation for the safeguard zones. It's it's it allowed us to get some funding to, to carry out the project that we're working on. Uh, so we've got some uh, some graphs here looking at the nitrate concentrations, and each one of the orange dots for each one of these sites is a sample of groundwater, and the red line across the middle is the drinking water standard. And um, it's actually not legal for us to put water into supply that um, has the concentration of anything above that red line. Um, so we have to do something to the water um, to to reduce that concentration. And so, as you can see, and one more thing to point out, I suppose, is that um, nitrate is, when it's there, it's there. It doesn't change very much. It's very consistent. So we're looking at 20 years worth of data here. And um, you do see very, very long-term increases or decreases in the concentration, but generally it, it's fairly consistent. Um, you do see a little bit of seasonal variation and obviously the um, there is there is some variation in that data. But when you compare it to graphs showing the concentration of certain um, pesticides, they look very different. Um, pesticides, they come and they go. Uh, the, the one that's probably the most interesting there is, or one of them, is the nutwell uh, cyclocrop and metacrop there on the, the top left. Uh, when the safeguard zone was designated, we've probably... Um, 2016, 2017. So you can see that's when the, the levels were shooting up quite rapidly and we were really concerned about it. And then by about 2019, they peaked and they're coming back down again. And that's not because of the, anything that we've done. Um, it's That's just pesticides for you. They come and they go. Um, in other ones, we see a certain amount of seasonal variation. Um, some of them are above the, uh, the drinking water standard. Others are not quite there yet. Um, Center zone, the, the bottom left there at uh, Mill Lane is probably the biggest issue that we've got in terms of pesticides. Um, we've got unusually high levels at some of our sources um, compared to other sites in the UK. Um, another really interesting thing is uh, the, the occurrence of atrazine at Tycoon Lane, which was withdrawn, I think, 20 years ago. So it just points again to the reason for these investigations is to try and understand how these catchments are operating. You know, what's leading to an increasing trend in atrazine in one of our sources when it hasn't been used for 20 years? And this, this um, is perhaps an indication of the length of time it takes for the water to travel from wherever the source was um, to uh, the point of abstraction. So we, what we can't say is wh where the, the peak will be. Um, we don't know how far in the future this is going to be before it starts to come back down again. And in actual fact, the, 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 the most likely source of the atrazine is the railways. Um, it was extensively used um, uh, by um, the network rail or whatever they would call it at that uh, time in history. So, um, I mentioned you know, we need to um, work out what we're going to do about this. And we've got uh, various options. Now, water companies historically have always been um, very much engineering organizations. They, they like building things. And so historically where um, there was something in the water and, and they wanted to remove it, they just said, that's fine, we'll just treat it. And so they would build treatments. And uh, this is the, the, the preferred technology for removing nitrate um, in groundwater. We don't do this currently uh, for the sandstone sources, but um, we have two of these plants in Yorkshire already, and we're just in the, in the, um, the process of designing a third one, which will be built uh, at Water Treatment Works, um, treating groundwater on the chalk in East Yorkshire. So it's um, ion exchange filtration um, is the technology. It's very effective, but the, the operational teams don't like it because it's a bit flaky and a bit difficult to use, to be honest. Um, have a, a, a nasty habit of, um, of, of going very wrong very quickly without any warning. So um, 
it's uh, very expensive to build. We're currently looking at somewhere between 12 and 20 million pounds to, to build the, the one with, that's in the design stage at the moment. So it's, it's very much a last resort, this treatment. Um, and uh, where we can do for nitrate, we will blend the water with lower nitrate water to get the concentration down. And that's what we currently do in the Saudi and Doncaster oil fields. But if the, if the um, concentrations were to increase uh, further, then we would, we would definitely have to build more treatment. So, uh, slightly different uh, process for removing pesticides. This is actually a very effective um, a bulletproof technology uh, compared to nitrate removal. Uh, gradual activated uh, carbon filtration. Essentially, you've got a standard water industry rapid gravity filter, and it's got car this activated carbon in, in the substrate. And the carbon's um, it's been treated in a way that, that means that it, um, it attracts uh, the organic substances like pesticides and they stick to it. And they will continue to do that until the carbon is saturated, um, which depending on how much uh, material it's moving will take a, a length of time. Uh, once it's saturated, you have to take the whole lot out, send it away, uh, they clean it up, which basically means they put it in a Chinese oven and cook it. Um, very expensive to do, uh, as you can imagine, to, to to do this sort of intervention. Um, but other than the, the, the occasions that you have to, to, to clean the carbon up, it's a very effective technology. And we have this um, pretty much, uh, I think in most of the water treatment works in Yorkshire have this technology already. So I mentioned the, the, the project that we're working on. There's two aspects to this. The first, the first one is to, um, to characterize each of the catchments that we're looking at. Um, and what we do is we, we gather in all the information that we can, and that's to do with the, the geology, so the solid geology, the superficial uh, material that sits on top, and the soils, um, and uh, the, we look at the, 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 the water quality, so lots of uh, samples from boreholes, we'll drill boreholes where the, they don't already exist to, so that we can get samples out of the, um, out of the sandstone. Um, we look at climatic factors, so what's the relationship between um, rainfall, for example, and recharge of, of water into the aquifer, and how is you know, the timing of rainfall, how, how does that affect um, how much material that comes down with the water into the aquifer. Uh, land use mapping, um, how has that changed over time? And we take all this information and we put it all together and we create these conceptual models. Um, and the purpose of the conceptual model is purely to show so is it a way to illustrate this is everything that we know or everything that we think we know about that particular catchment and we can use that to to try and work out how that catchment is operating where is the material coming from if we can say that we can't always but we try and narrow it down how is it getting down from from the origin down to the aquifer what's happening to it in, in the aquifer is it becoming denitrified for example and this is why we see some places that don't have high nitrate uh, in the groundwater that could be coming from a, a common source to somewhere else that does see high nitrate because that denitrification in the aquifer isn't happening. So there's lots of, lots of complexity and this is the reason for these conceptual models. And the other aspect of the project um, is to, uh, to look to the catchment. Uh, this is very much uh, the future um, rather than resorting to building um, ever increasing amounts of treatment at our water treatment works, um, the whole of the water industry, and I think really the, the, the agricultural sector um, as well, are now looking um, to catchment solutions to, to try and address um, environmental issues. And that includes um, nutrients and, and, and uh, other, other substances in uh, controlled water, so the surface waters and the, the groundwater. And so I'm not going to say too much more about, about this because this is what other people are going to talk about, but but suffice to say, um, it's very much um, our goal and we're of the mindset that any uh, proposed uh, solutions that we uh, come up with and try and implement in the catchments um, to deal with some of these issues um, need to be not only working for, for the water company and the environment and all of it, but they also have to work for farm businesses because otherwise they're not going to work. Um, and that, so it's looking for those win-win um, type uh, solutions. Things like um, trying to find ways to, to uh, make the soil better at retaining nutrients, 
um, what after after the, the, the crop has been harvested, so that those nutrients can be available to as a head start for the following crop, um, which just means that you don't need to put more um, or you need to put less perhaps potentially um, onto the, the following crop. Um, and so it's a benefit to the farm business because they're not having to, to buy as much nutrients, but also uh, if that soil is holding onto the nutrients better, hopefully that's less of the nutrient going down into the aquifer. So that's where the win-win comes in. Um, and really that's, I think, me done. Um, so thank you very much. I don't know if uh, there will be questions or do you want to leave those for, for later in the process? Thanks very much, Paul. I've been keeping an eye out and it doesn't look like there are any questions popping up. So just because we've got so much to cover this morning, sure, I'm going to ask yeah. Amelia to jump in, but we hopefully will have a little bit of time at the end. Uh, so anybody who does have a question, a burning question, doesn't necessarily have to be fitting into the uh, speaker presentation slot. Please do just pop those in the Q&A as we go along. Yeah, Thank you very much. I always feel like I learn really such a lot from these uh, sessions. Not a hydrogeologist myself, but work uh, a lot with farmers in the interaction between the activity that happens on the land and how it all filters down. Um, just like a, a little university level uh, lecture, really interesting. Thanks so much, Paul. Yeah, hopefully not too much lecture, but... Uh... No, no, that's in a good way. Um, <laughs> Amelia, are you able to share your slides for us, uh, please? And we will uh, very nicely segue into um, okay, we know what some of the challenges are. It's been quite a challenging year for farming uh, generally so far, but there's also a lot coming down the pipeline in terms of exactly what uh, Paul spoke about. Win-wins, identifying what farm businesses need in order to tick those environmental boxes, not a box ticking exercise, protect the natural capital um, and the land and the resources that the food that we grow is dependent on, but also with an acknowledgement that that's a public good that is worthy of uh, public support. So I know you're going to cover plenty of that uh, today, Amelia, but also a fair amount of detail. Just to let people know, um, if I know from your uh, previous sessions that we've done, there'll be quite a lot of detailed content in these slides. So this recording will be made available. The information that's on here is also in various um, gov.uk documents that will have been released. So when we send the email around to everybody and also publish this, we'll make sure that the links to all of the relevant pages are there. So um, don't feel like you need to be scribbling notes throughout Amelia's session. Is that all right, Amelia? Have I missed that's anything? That's perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. OK, over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Laura. Um, morning, everyone. My name's Amelia Rome. Um, I'm a farm business consultant at the Anderson Centre. And this morning I'm going to be talking through incorporating environmental grants and nature markets into farm business planning. Um, I'm going to start by apologising, as Laura has already hinted, we've got quite a bit to cover. The environmental market is quite broad, so we have quite a bit to cover this morning. So I'm going to go at a fair pace. Um, I'm going to go into varying amounts of detail, depending on the relevance of each scheme to the Selby and Doncaster catchment area. Um, some schemes won't be relevant to the catchment area, so we'll just skim over those. But before I actually delve into any scheme detail to begin with, um, I do actually want to start, if I can go to the, there we go. I do want to start by actually underlining what's driving environmental schemes and what's driving policy towards this environmental um, outlook. So, and that starts with explaining to you what government actually wants. Now, governments in all parts of the UK have set themselves quite ambitious environmental targets um, and these focus on similar areas although there are differences in emphasis between each of the devolved regions. Um, in the future most government spending on agriculture is going to be directed at meeting these goals um, and all administrations also wish to boost the economic performance of farming, um, if not necessarily the volume of food produced. 
at present, it is a secondary consideration and may remain so in terms of food production secondary to environmental outputs. These high level goals of government are translated into specific asks and actions that are desired. And again, although there are regional differences, many of the same things appear are appearing in different schemes across the UK. Now, in terms of England and what that means for England, that brings us on to the Environmental Improvement Plan. Now, the Environmental Improvement Plan, improvement plan um, is a very, very detailed document. And what this slide is aiming to do is to basically highlight some of the key implications of the Environmental Improvement Plan, plan for the agricultural industry. Now, the EIP, as I've said, is a very broad document. It covers all of the sectors for the UK and for which DEFRA also has a degree of responsibility for. There is a crossover with many other departments, including the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, the Department for Leveling Up, for example, and then Housing and Communities. Clearly, there is and will continue to be a large part for agriculture to play in delivering against the goals of the Environmental Improvement Plan. And this, again, I've set out here. Now, in total, the document's about 262 pages, and it mentions the word target about 269 times. Um, and a key part of this drive to deliver those targets is the 30 by 30 initiative. Now, the fr and this is the framework which was agreed at the COP27 um, meeting in Egypt. And it essentially aims to designate 30% of our land and ocean as protected areas for nature by 2030. Um, and whilst it was adopted at COP27, it has actually been in discussion since COP15. There are a series of broad implications for agriculture in terms of how is it is expected to, to deliver against these targets. Um, and in truth, the approach to reaching the targets isn't too stretching, actually, at the moment. Much of it is actually pre um, predict is actually expected to be achieved through the uptake of the SFI scheme, which we'll be, we will touch on in a little bit more detail later on. Originally, the target for SFI had been quoted as 70% of land and 70% of land managers. However, in the Environmental Improvement Plan, this is expanded slightly and there is a broad mention of between 65 to 80%. Now, this does mean in many cases that there will be an increase in revenue to deliver environmental outcomes, even if the revenue from other areas is in decline, because these are the objectives of the Environmental Improvement Plan. Now, there is an inevitably more regulation to come for agriculture. While it is not specific as to what that may be, there is a scat this that is scattered throughout the Environmental Improvement Plan in terms of mentionings of permitting agriculture coming into the emissions trading scheme, etc., and a focus on regulation for high emissions sectors. So the Environmental Improvement Plan sets out a number of targets and the key goals RBs. Essentially, there are 10 key goals within the Environmental Improvement Plan. These are outlined on this slide here. I'm not going to speak on every single goal, um, but some do not have direct implications for agriculture and some do. There are two goals here, goal eight and nine, which do have significant direct implications for agriculture. Goal eight does reference with the re-wetting of peat in order to reduce flooding. And goal nine does also talk about the eradicate eradication of TB and the introduction of a target operating model of border control. Now, if we go through and we're going to start looking at the schemes that have been are trying to deliver the objectives of the Environmental Improvement Plan. These are the government schemes that are currently available. And I like to set it out like this because there's a lot available and some overlap and it's a bit confusing. But if we set it out like this, it's much easier. Previously, under Michael Gove's government, we had environmental management and environmental public money for public goods. And we were, saw the, the creation of environmental land management, the ELM scheme. Now, the ELM scheme isn't one particular scheme. I like to think of ELMS as an umbrella. And underneath the umbrella of ELMS, we almost have what we had before. It's almost a pillar system. It's not a pillar system, but it's very, very similar. We have the sustainable farming incentive. 
Now, underneath the umbrella of the Sustainable Farming Incentive, we have the SFI pilot. Some of those are still live. We have the SFI 22 scheme. Now, I don't think there are any of those that are still live. There may be a few late schemes still running. We have SFI 23, and then we also have SFI 24. And we also have the animal health and welfare pathway that's kind of sitting in its own little bubble. Countryside stewardship is still there. Mid-tier applications are going to be no more. That has been rolled into the SFI. But under countryside stewardship, we are still going to have higher tier. We are expecting more information on higher tier later this summer if we haven't had it before autumn. Capital grants used to sit underneath the umbrella of countryside stewardship. They're now their own standalone thing. So capital grants are one-off grant schemes for things like fencing, concrete yard renewal, hedge row laying, hedge planting, etc. things like that. And then we do also the, the larger scale scheme under ELMS is landscape recovery. We then have our productivity schemes, and these are more capital based schemes. Now, these are split in two. We have advice, training and skills. Now, under that, we have the Future Farming Resilience Fund. There's also going to be schemes for new entrance support, and there's also going to be research and development and also tier. Now, TIA is uh, the, is it training in agriculture and horticulture department? They haven't really done much yet, but we are expecting that they will start to roll stuff out in the future. And then we have capital grants. These are larger scale capital grants. So not your fencing, not your hedge planting. This is more infrastructure based under the Farming Investment Fund. Now, under the Farming Investment Fund, we have the Farming Equipment and Technology Fund. That, that, that is a shopping list of items. So that's things like your cattle handling systems, your EID readers, your um auto retrofit auto steer and things like that and then we have some larger scale grants following five themes under the farming investment fund and i will touch on those in a little bit more detail but really this slide just aims to help de defog the very foggy landscape that is all of the schemes that are currently available from the rpa and defra now I want to show you on a slide what's going to happen through the ag transition in terms of the replacement of BPS through countryside stewardship and SFI agreements. Now, this is in percentages. So in 2020, maximum BPS remaining was 100 percent. Now, as you see, as we go through the ag transition, that tails off to zero percent by 2028. As of through 2028, we are then through the ag transition period. Now, what we have seen to date as the year ending 2024, an increase in countryside stewardship agreements. And we now, now are over on a crossover where stewardship agreements has actually overtaken BPS. Now, what we have seen also is that buildup of SFI agreements. So total spend between stewardship and SFI is getting nearer to what we saw when we were at the maximum BPS. What that's going to look like going forward as BPS continues to tail off, I don't know. I should imagine that the SFI bar does get wider and we start to see a building of higher tier there into the countryside stewardship agreement slides. Now, state of play for steward for SFI. SFI has now swallowed what used to be countryside stewardship mid-tier. So stewardship mid-tier, you are no longer going to be able to apply for that as a standalone scheme. Most of the options that were available under mid-tier have been rolled into the SFI. Now, the SFI has rolling application window. It should be open all year round. It is currently open for SFI 24 applications, but only if you submit an expression of interest. It was meant to be open for everybody on the 22nd of July, but you still cannot apply for it without submitting a submission, an expression of interest. There are now 102 options slash actions available. 23 of those are SFI 23 actions and options. 20 are brand new SFI options, which we've never seen before. And around 50 have been adopted from countryside stewardship. 90% of SFI options are three year, have three year duration periods. A few do now have five year duration periods. And there has been an update, as Laura mentioned, we've had some more guidance and updated guidance released on the SFI scheme 
out this week. There have been a few tweaks in terms of rule changes for the SFI 24 scheme. You would have noticed that following the new guidance announced in May that Legume Fallow uh, went to a static option. Well, as at the new guidance released this week, that is back to rotational. There are a few tweaks in that guidance. So if you have jumped on the and you have got an SFI 24 scheme, please just check the changes in the guidance. Higher tier countryside stewardship is still going to be available as a standalone scheme, and that's going to be through bespoke agreements. And we are expecting more details on that later this year. We now have actions with area limits in terms of some of them are 25% of a field parcel and some of them are no more than 25% of an SFI scheme area. So please keep an eye out for those. The new handbook for the SFI scheme is significant. It's a good 366 pages long and every single option is detailed there. Now, what is also available online is the grant finder. So you can filter through if you are an arable based system or a grassland based system, you can filter through the options which are relevant for you. Now, SFI is continuing to be the basic offer. Now, as I've mentioned, there is a target of 70% upwards to 80% of farms participating. Now, previously the SFI has been three-year agreements, but now we have some options within SFI which are five have a five-year duration period. Previously with the SFI 23, it was possible to upgrade agreements annually. Now with the changes this week, if you want to add options onto your new agreement, um, this is yet to be confirmed, but it is looking like you're going to have to create a new agreement and you can't add those in annually, but we are waiting for the RPA to actually confirm that more clearly. Now, CS higher tier goes above and beyond what you can deliver within, um, within the SFI. So higher tier is for more intensive land management. Now, the SFI and higher tier is looking like it's going to have year round applications once up and fully running with SFI having quarterly payments rather than you doing a claim annually and receiving your payment about 18 months after you did the work. You will, re you will receive your payments automatically quarterly. Now, the SFI scheme is now in its third version in as many years and the scheme pays area payments for actions towards the environment um, on an income foregone plus cost basis. I've detailed there the, the action groups, which have a number of options sitting under, under them, and each option has an object, a number of objectives which, which you have to try and deliver against. Now, they are going to continue to add actions and options to the SFI agreement. This, this scheme has been designed in a way so it can develop and change over the years. I want to just run through the main options under a number of the different actions. I'm not going to go doing this in any amount of detail. I'm not going to go into specific options in detail because we just simply do not have time today. But under your actions for soils, you have the three options there. You have your SAM 1, SAM 2 and SAM 3, which were available under the SFI 23 scheme. You also now have an additional three options there for the SFI 24 scheme, including no-till farming, multi-species spring and summer sown cover crops and also winter cover following maize crops. Your actions for nutrient management, those three were there and available under the SFI 23 scheme. We have no new actions available for nutrient management. Integrated pest management, again, those four options there were all previously available under the SFI 23 scheme and they are still available under the SFI 24 scheme. We have a new action group for the SFI 24 scheme in terms of actions for precision farming. Now we have four options here. We have the variable rate application to, of nutrients. We have camera or remote sensor guided herbicide spraying. We have non-mechanical robotic weeding and we also have mechanical robotic weeding options. What we have now is actions for farmland and wildlife and habitats. And some of these were available under the SFI 23 scheme. A lot of these have previously been available under countryside stewardship and they have been rolled into the SFI. Some of these are brand new. AHL 1, AHL 2 and AHL 3 were all available previously under the SFI 23 scheme. AHW 1, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way through till 12 are all new for SFI 24. Now, most of these were available previously, or you will be familiar with them from the old countryside stewardship mid tier in terms of you now have supplementary winter bird feeding, skylark plots, basic overwinter stubbled, whole, whole crop spring cereals, unharvested cereal headlands, or low input harvested cereal crops, to name a few. Actions for farmland, wildlife and habitats on grassland. IGL 1, 2 and 3 were all previously available under the SFI 23 scheme. GRH 1, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11 and SCR 1 and 2 are all new for SFI 24. We still have actions for moorland. So MOR1 was previously available under SFI 23, but we now have a n number of upland and moorland specific actions if you are above the moorland line. Actions for species, reco species recovery and management. This is new for SFI 24. Um, some of these would have been familiar. These are very similar to what has previously been available under HLS, but they are now available within the SFI. Actions for agroforestry. Again, this is new for SFI 24. And if you want a higher density of agroforestry, there is going to be options that will sit within higher tier for that. Actions for boundary features, HRW 1, 2 and 3. These are the three hedgerow options which were available previously under SFI 23. They're still available there in SFI 24. But we also have the addition of BND 1, which is the maintenance of dry stone walls, and BND, BND 2, which is the maintenance of earth banks or stone faced hedge banks. Actions for water bodies. Some of these previously were available within SFI 23. Some of these are brand new options, totally new, and some have been moved across from stewardship. So we have things like ditch management, pond management, infield grass strips, arable reversion to grassland, a nil fertilizer supplement for intensive grassland, etc. Actions for buffer strips, AHL4 and IGL3. These are the buffer strip options which were previously available under the SFI23 scheme. They are still there for SFI24, but you have the addition of four more buffer strip options depending on what environmental features you have on farm. Actions for heritage. These are new actions for SFI 24. Some of these have moved across from stewardship too. So you have the maintenance of weatherproof traditional farm buildings, the control of scrub on historic features and the management of historic features on grassland and also the maintenance um, of engineered water bodies. Organic farming options. These are, again, new for SFI 24. There used to be a number of organic options under countryside stewardship, which you could stack with the SFI 23. But now we have organic options within SFI 24, which both include the organic conversion. And also, if you're already fully organic, organic management of fully organic um, farms, including an, over, an organic version of overwinter stubble and supplementary bird food and also under sown cereals. The common land payment is still there. That has not gone anywhere. So if you are farming on a common and if two or more of you enter into an SFI agreement, you will receive that common land payment. And also the management payment is still there. So it is paid £20 per hectare on the first 50 hectares into the agreement with a hundred with a thousand pounds maximum but this is double for your first year of the agreement if you sign up by march 2025 so it'll be 40 pounds per hectare on the first 50 hectares with a ceiling of two thousand pounds for your management payment in your first year that's a very whistle stop tour of the options available now, in terms of stacking SFI, most SFI options have been designed to be compatible so you, with each other. So you can cite them on the same piece of land. Some options are what I call base options options and then you can stack a number of options on top of those as long as they are compatible to so to give you an example on an arable field you can have SAM1 which is your soil management plan and your organic matter testing you can also have an integrated pest management plan you can have your IPM4 your no use of insecticides you can 
you'll also have have a multi-species cover crop over the winter. You'll have your nutrient management plan. You've got some grassy field corners in there and some buffer strips. And you'll also have your hedge management options around the boundary of the field. So you can really start to build quite a comprehensive scheme. Now, if in doubt, if you're unsure on compatibility, I don't know if my, my camera is going to blur this out. Under the guidance for each option, whether you're looking at the handbook or online, there is a table under each option which outlines which options you can stack that options with and which and it the, it will exclude the ones that you can't so please just check if there's two options that you want to do within a field within the same year just check whether they are compatible with each other now it is fairly obvious and quite logical where options can't be stacked so if you have to grow something specific so you can't have a winter cover crop on the same area that you are growing winter bird food because you're growing one thing and trying to get paid twice you can't do that and also where the land type is wrong so you can't situate arable options on permanent grassland etc now if you do have an existing countryside stewardship scheme the interaction of the various sfi actions especially when combined with potential countryside stewardship ones can potentially get quite complicated there is guidance in the sfi handbook so if you have an environmental stewardship scheme if you have a countryside stewardship scheme if you have an sfi 23 scheme or an sfi pilot scheme it will outline which options are compatible with each SFI action under the 24 scheme. So please do just check. So the handbook does clearly state what stewardship options are compatible and the computer system should stop ineligible options being placed on ineligible features. So there is a safety net there, but please just double check. Now, in terms of SFI applications, SFI is going to be open to all land managers this summer. So even those that never previously claimed BPS and have been under five hectares, so were never in receipt of BPS, as long as you register with the RPA, you need an SBI number and you need to register your field parcels, you will be able to apply to, for the SFI. SFI 24 from this summer. It is important that before you apply for the SFI that you get your maps correct with the RPA in terms of your field boundaries and your land covers, because if you get halfway through an application and find out a land covers wrong or a field is missing and you've got to register it, that change might not feed through to your application. You might have to withdraw it and start again and you go around in circles. Just make sure everything's correct before you start your application. Tenants do not need your landlord's permission to apply and where you have an FBT or an AHA, only tenants can apply. So the SFI is for those who are managing the, scheme, the land for the duration of the scheme. It would be sensible and polite just to let your landlord know that you are going into the SFI scheme. If you have an annual rolling FBT and you've had that for the last 5, 10, 15 years, that is evidence that you will have management control for the duration of the three year scheme. You will also may need to apply for a heifer map, which is a historic environment farm environment record. You just type that into Google, whack in your SBI number and it will generate a heifer map. This will outline any archaeological or historic features which you may have on your farm, including shine sites. Some options can't be placed. It's a very small number of options, but some options cannot be placed on archaeological or historic features. And some options you have to tweak what you're doing. So, for example, herbal lays, you can't have deep rooting herbs on archaeological or historic features. Features. So you do just need to consider if you have any of those. SFI agreements will start on the first day of the month. So if you apply right now your and your agreement goes through, um, you will potentially start your agreement on the 1st of September. Um, you generally cannot remove land from an agreement. So once a field parcel is in your agreement, when you do an application automatically, all of your field parcels will live within that agreement. That doesn't necessarily mean anything. You might have an apart field parcel that lives within the agreement, but you might not have any options on it. There is still an annual declaration that is going to be required and plus evidence if, if requested. But this is looking like to be a very simple tick box. Yes, I've done everything I've said I was going to do. If for whatever reason you have been unable to do something, you must tell the RPA as soon as possible. If you are going to be unable to complete something within your SFI agreement, you must tell them. And they are going to review this on a case by case basis in terms of what they are going to do if you if that does happen. Now, 
I just want to demonstrate to you what an SFI scheme actually looks like. So this is a, a loosely mixed farm, 500 hectares of arable, 80 hectares of grass. Um, this They are currently in an SFI 23 scheme. They have not gone into the SFI 24 yet. So there is additional income here to be added through the SFI 24 scheme. But on a 580 hectare farm, they are generating roughly £63,800 a year, which is roughly £110 a hectare, which is just over 50% of what BPS was at its peak. Now, not one option pays a lot of money. Not one option is a groundbreaking option, but they do all add up. And just by tweaking a few management practices and looking what you're already looking at what you're already doing, you can generally generate some significant income for your farm business. Now, I do want to touch on other English schemes. Now, this slide does summarize what to expect in terms of other support schemes over the next few months slash a year. We are expecting another round of landscape recovery to be available. We thought it was in spring, but we are still waiting on that. Now, landscape recovery goes above and beyond what you can deliver through the SFI and through higher tier, and it's for 500 hectare plus schemes. So these are large landscaped schemes and they are 20 year schemes. Um, these have a number of phases. So you have you pull your application together in terms of what you want to achieve. You then have a number of years to figure out two years to figure out how you're going to achieve that before you actually put it into practice. So. We also have productivity capital grants, as I outlined on that first slide where I showed you where everything falls. And these are between 50 to 60 percent capital grants. Some of them are 60 percent plus. So we have the Farming Equipment and Technology Fund. So this is all done online and this is small scale equipment and it's fixed payments for 120 specified items. It's an online application. The minimum grant was 2000. Previously, it has also been a thousand and the maximum amount you can apply for under this scheme is 25,000 um, with a limit of 50,000 because they split the scheme into two. Um, and there is various, various rounds of the Farming Equipment and Technology Fund. So you essentially have a shopping list of items under a number of different headings. Um, we have things like animal welfare and productivity, etc. And you can basically choose your items. These are things like EID readers, cattle handling systems, forestry grants, etc. Now, we then also have large scale capital grants under the farming investment funds. And these, in, these follow five themes. So we have productivity, which includes solar. We have slurry. We have animal housing, water management and adding value. Now, these are very large scale schemes. So for the slurry investment scheme, for example, this is, has been a 50 percent grant. The minimum grant value has been twenty five thousand pounds. The maximum grant value has been two hundred and fifty thousand pounds from and that is to bring people up to a minimum of six months slurry storage we've also had the calf housing and also the hen housing so this is under the animal housing grant this is geared towards the beef and dairy sector and this was a 40 percent grant with a minimum grant of fifteen thousand pounds and a maximum grant of five hundred thousand pounds none of these are currently open for phase one so these are two staged applications you do it's like an expression of interest but there's a stage one where you put in your business details and outline what you'd like to do if successful at that point you would be invited to submit a full application we've only had one round of adding value so far um, we are expecting another round again we don't know when and also water management we've had two rounds of the water management grant the second round the deadline for applications for full applications for the second round for that is the end of october now, in terms of continuing on other English schemes, there are also a number of forestry schemes available. Some of them are through the Forestry Commission and the, most notably is the England Wood, English Woodland Creation Offer. We also have the Shared Prosperity Fund. Now, this is done through local authorities. Some local authorities received funding, some didn't. And this is through the Leveling Up campaign. So it's ring fence for rural product projects, which includes farm diversifications. Again, as I've said, it's very pat patchy. Some local authorities have not developed schemes for businesses. Some have. Some have been open and shut. Some are still open. So it's worth looking into your local authority if it is available in your area. 
There is also the Future Farming Resilience Fund for, for, to help improve business decision making and farm business management. That's available through until March 2025. We are unsure if there's going to be something to replace that afterwards. DEFRA have not confirmed, but Amanda will touch on that in a little bit more detail later on. Now, countryside stewardship and capital grants. There is, as I've mentioned before, a standalone capital grant scheme, and this is for things like fencing, hedgerow creation, hedge laying, water troughs, concrete yard renewal, livestock and machinery tracks, covered sprayer areas. This is available as its standalone scheme. It previously used to be tacked onto stewardship under mid tier, you used to be able to do revenue and capital options. They've now broken the capital options off and it is as its own standalone scheme. You have three years to undertake the works now as previously it used to be two. There are new options that have also recently been added to the capital grant scheme so it is worth looking at those. Some items do require support from the catchment sensitive farming officer but you no longer need to be in a high water priority area to receive your catchment sensitive farming officer's approval. There is also no longer a limit on the value of capital items that you can apply for. There used to be a limit and now there is not. However, if your application goes above £50,000, you do just need a letter from your accountant to um, justify that you can afford the capital works. You can claim as many times as you like. So you can put in a large application and you don't have to do all of the work and claim in one go. You can do a bit, claim for it, do a bit more and claim for it, which will help with cash flow and you can apply for the capital grant scheme as many times as you want you can do a bit of fencing finish that scheme go again and do another one so you can keep rolling so have a look at the list don't do it for the sake of the grant but if there is something that you need to do then it is well worth looking at it now biodiversity net gain we'll park sfi for a moment we'll park um capital grants we'll park other things we're going to look at biodiversity net gain which is more towards the private sector now um from november 23 all new developments from january 2020 have to deliver a 10 percent net gain on the biodiversity levels that was on the site before development some people got very excited about this um, now it depends on the habitats some habitats have a higher baseline of biodiversity already than some the actual biodiversity levels of an arable field is quite low and 10 percent of not a lot is not a lot a lot of developments will try and deliver biodiversity net gain on site because then they'll be able to keep hold of the value of those biodiversity credits um, so which is where you see a number of new housing developments or industrial developments will have a grassy area with some trees and a bit of a pond that is biodiversity net gain now developers have three options for delivering biodiversity net gain they can either deliver it on site off site or they can purchase biodiversity net biodiversity credits now the value of a credit the further from a site it is reduces so you have to purchase more to deliver the same level of net gain so if, if the site that you are delivering the net gain on is very, very far away from the site where you are building, you have to deliver more, if that makes sense. So um, the biodiversity net gain distance to the development has to be in is if it is in the same LPA, there is no penalty. If it's in the neighbouring LPA, the penalty, penalty is 25%. And if it's further afield, then a 50% penalty on the value is applied. Um, I just do want to make people aware that there are some biodiversity net gain schemes happening. These are quite high level schemes and it is between the land manager and the developer. So there is going to be solicitors involved. These are very in-depth schemes. You can stack it on SFI as long as you're not being paid for the same thing twice. It has to go above and beyond um, but some of these schemes in certain areas where there is a lot of development are going to be quite significant. Now, there is a Habitat Bank building with a number of private firms that are pooling hab um, air land together in order to service the biodiversity net gain requirement going forward. But if you actually look at the number of houses per LPA per year that are going to be built the requirement per lpa for biodiversity net gain is roughly six hectares so it's not 
the large market that we initially thought it was going to be. But if there is development going on near you, then it is well worth keeping your eye in. Now, sites must be maintained for 30 years after completion. 30 years is a very long time, and I suspect that actually these sites are going to become permanent. Those habitats are potentially going to become permanent. Now, nutrient neutrality, probably not as relevant for the Doncaster and Selby water catchment area. This is more in the um, in Cornwall, in Essex, Kent, Hampshire and Dorset, Herefordshire, Shropshire, uh, Somerset, Suffolk and Wiltshire. But it's very similar to biodiversity net gain where developments or new developments have to demonstrate nutrient neutrality. And again, that is done through units and credits and a value per credit, depending on this, the distance from the site. But I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail because it's not relevant for the Doncaster and Selby catchment. Carbon markets. Always get asked about carbon markets. Uh, what are carbon markets? Now, aside from legislation, carbon markets are can arguably be the most efficient tool for dealing with carbon um, with climate change and the carbon markets work on a cap and trade structure. Um, emission intensive sectors are given a total amount of permitted emissions for the year and this cap is progressively lowered. Um, organisations can either direct their finance to reduce their emissions or buy additional permits from under emitters at the market rate. So this is where we're seeing carbon offsetting in large industries. For many years, the market rate had been well below the opportunity cost of reducing emissions. Um, however, in recent years, the price for some emissions trading schemes has risen um, and it has risen sufficiently to start having a bigger impact now. Hang on, I'll bring up all the bits. Now, the chart from The Economist here shows the comparative cost of emitting one tonne of CO2 equivalent. Um, the price of carbon and the scope of what is covered by each ETS varies there by country. Now, the UK's total emissions in 2021 was 425 million tonnes. The International Emissions Trading Association estimate that carbon markets could facilitate $1 trillion worth of transactions by 2050. So these are large scale sector carbon markets. Now, how do we actually funnel that down to schemes that are available on farm and to schemes that are available to farmers. So one carbon scheme that currently is regulated is the Woodland Carbon Code, and this is available through the Forestry Commission. Now, sites that are going into this scheme, they must not have been wooded in the last 25 years, and nor can they be deep peat, and it needs to be suitably managed. Now, it does within the guidance mention that there is a buffer. So if you don't deliver more than your buffer amount, then you would have to either have to, I have to either repay or replace the carbon not sequestered so if you do want new woodland this is a scheme to potentially look at there is also the peatland code so this is available on blanket bogs and any raised bogs which are either actively eroding or drained there has to be a minimum of 50 centimeters of peat and the minimum project duration for this is 30 years and i have highlighted there on the map that any areas where there is blanket bogs and raised bogs there. So again, not relevant for the Doncaster and Selby catchment, um, but the project for the Peatland Carbon Code does generate credits through delivering category change. Um, and again, predicted change within five years and the resultant change in the net GH greenhouse gas emissions versus the pre-project emissions that were projected. Then we have soil carbon. Now, on particular report, one particular report does highlight the challenges of adding soil organic carbon to using different methods, um, either through no-till, min-till, trying to keep organic matter within the soil. And again, as I've said, the easiest way to do that is through organic manure. Clearly, this is at odds with other aspects of what is, what is perceived to be environmentally friendly farming. Um, now, some carbon markets at the minute are unregulated and there are a number of private schemes that are trying to pay or are paying a premium for more carbon friendly farming. In terms of soil carbon credits, once you sell a tonne of carbon, 
It is like selling a ton of wheat. It has left your farm. It's not yours anymore. Do not sell carbon that you may need yourself to offset your activities in the future, because once you've sold it, it's gone. Now, what we do then also have is climate farming, and this is the annual carbon that is burnt through growing crops. Now, some of these are more private schemes, and these schemes reward for moving to a more climate-friendly practice. So these are schemes that are paying private premiums for farming in a particular way, which is deemed climate and carbon friendly. So there are some schemes out there incentivizing for regenerative practices, etc. And again, the SFI scheme does also remunerate for climate friendly farming and it is also helping to bridge the income gap through regenerative farming systems do use models to calculate the difference between overall farm emissions and a baseline so it does include the sequestration model but it does also require a commitment to undertake a set of prescribed actions and depending on which private scheme you go for some commitments do tend to be short term and some are up to 15 years and again there is an element of financial risk so if you leave a scheme early they may be potential penalties. There are a number of key risks I do just want to highlight in terms of the carbon market. There is a reason that the legal profession are getting excited about carbon markets. They are currently unregulated apart from the Woodland Carbon Code. Again, the non-permanence of the scheme, the risk that any carbon sequestered is emitted either by nature or bad practice. So if you if something happens that's out of your control and all of your carbon disappears, are you to blame? What happens in that case? The science may also catch up with you if you have a tool that says you have this amount of soil carbon today in 10 years time. Has the science overtaken you and it turns out you never had that carbon that you sold? Where does um, the responsibility for that lie. So please just be careful and just have a look, do your research before you jump ship. The price of carbon, as I did also mention, does remain below the opportunity cost. It is an early market. It is still developing. Do not undersell your assets. They may be worth more in the future than they do at the minute in their infancy. What does this actually mean for business and how do we actually tie this into business planning going forward? So I've done a very, very broad overview of all environmental schemes and all environmental markets that are currently out there and available for farms. But what does it actually mean for your farm business? BPS has halved for English farmers this year. So it's half of what you received at your peak and it is going to continue to trail off through to 2027. At the minute, um, there is a large black hole that this government does need to fill and how they fill that um, is yet to be confirmed. But at the minute, that is the BPS is going to continue to trail off. Now, how can your farm business recover this? Uh, can you recover that lost income through payments from new schemes? Um, remember, profit under these schemes will be lower than BPS. BPS was almost money for almost nothing. Um, now with the SFI, you do have to do something, but have a look at the options. You may be surprised. A number of the options may fit what you're already doing on farm. Will it? Do you need to improve farming efficiency, including a change in costs? Do you need to revisit that um, resource efficiency curve in terms of inputs put, you're putting in versus outputs you're receiving out? Looking at that peak part of efficiency. Efficiency. With efficiency comes wider gross margins. And there, if you can have a handle on your overhead costs, will mean you receive increased profits. Are there other income sources? Do you need to do something else? And do you have a plan to do this? Some businesses potentially may need an exit strategy. Some people may not be able to recover income lost from the BPS scheme and they may not be viable going forward. Some may be able to. Some may go increase productivity. Some may increase income from other schemes and they may be able to weather this storm. There are opportunities out there for the best businesses, both expansion, growth and improvement of own efficiencies. Now, it's about breaking the cycle. It's taking a step back and looking at your business and not getting stuck in this cycle of 
low profits. So therefore, you're expanding for economies of scale because you've got high overhead costs. You, you need more ground to have more income. And then you're taking on short term land at higher rents that are at a distance. So therefore, you need to try and maximize the output to cover those higher rents. There's extra travel and extra overhead costs there because it's at a distance. And you're taking on larger machinery. So they have higher depreciation. You've got more HP, for example. You then are spread too thinly. So you've got weed, soil, fertility issues. Your management is overstretched and you've got a higher overhead cost base. Therefore, you've got high costs and disappointing yields and you're stuck in that low profit cycle. It's about taking a step back and focusing on cost effective production in terms of sustainable and appropriate rotations, proportionate labour and machinery costs, selecting which land to crop, taking out the worst performing areas, looking at what you're already doing. And can you be remunerated for that through the SFI scheme by making minimal tweaks or maybe even not having to tweak anything at all? It's about taking a step back and just looking at your farm business in detail. Now, in terms of maximising environmental income, as I've said, the best margin is by getting paid for what you're already doing. I suspect most arable farms, not many, are using insecticides. Receipt, get that money. Sam, one, most farms are doing soil organic matter testing. You'll all do soil management plans. You may as well receive that payment that is the best margin you're not incurring any more cost as you already do it then as i've said the greatest margin again is where there is least change to the farming system required can you tweak a few things that you're doing so you can achieve and start delivering sfi objectives and therefore receiving the payments treat elms treat any environmental management scheme like any other farm enterprise it's going to significantly potentially um provide your business with significant income streams going forward. If that was a diversification, you would be treating it like a separate enterprise, treat it like a separate enterprise, give it the detail and time that it deserves. And don't do it for the sake of the grant. Get the grant if you're going to do it. Don't put in a load of tracks just because you want the grant money. But if you need a load of tracks and you've got a new block and you need and it's going to it's a big way around on the road and you can just cut through and you can get CSFO approval, then go for it. Just do not do it for the sake of the grant. You'll be no financially better off. Now, that brings me to the end. I hopefully have kept two time. We've covered a hell of a lot of ground um, in varying levels of detail. But hopefully I've managed to tie it back down to a farm business level for you. If you do have any questions, please ask at the end. But I think now I'm handing back over to Laura. Um, I'm not going to talk to you about the Future Farming Resilience Fund because Amanda is going to do that in a short moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Millie. I am always in awe of quite how much you can hold in your head at once and make it all make sense. I am very glad that we'll have reference material because I think that that's probably a record of just how much you've covered in actually your seven minutes early which I appreciate very much it gives yes. us a little bit extra time in the end so thank you um, and well done I think if I was watching this as a farmer or a land manager I'd take from Paul's bit at the beginning okay you can see that there are some both environmental challenges and also it looks like depending on how I'm managing things some of the inputs that I'm paying good money for are ending up in the water rather than on the land doing good stuff so that's the the thing that should be changed and then listening to you I'd be thinking it seems like there are quite a lot of options for me to get some support as to how to make those changes but actually too many for me myself alongside running my farm business to actually get my head around what my best options are which is why hopefully Amanda is going to now come in and say if people are feeling like that and we know from talking to farmers across the country that a lot of people are what is one of the options that they can do uh, to yeah, get some support from people like yourself who are able to get their head around all of this stuff and, um, and put it in a, a sensible next step. Hopefully, Amanda, I haven't oversold you there. I know from speaking to you previously <laughs> that that's the kind of thing we're talking about. So I will run your slides if that's OK. Just bear with me while I share that. Thank you. And then I will hand things over. There we are. Okay, 
so good morning everyone i'm amanda cornville smith and i'm the assistant regional coordinator for ricardo's future farming resilience fund based in yorkshire um, so I don't know if any of you have already signed up to Future Farming Resilience Fund or, or have heard about it, but it was um, set up um, with the changes with Ag Transition. Um, so this opening slide here um, is just one of our um, leaflets um, that we've had printed. don't know, you may have seen them at um, various shows and things. So next slide, please, Laura. And obviously, I've uh, I've introduced myself. So next slide, please, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. Um. So yeah. So Defra um set up um this Future Farm Resilience Fund to support businesses um through agriculture transition, and it is a free service offered to farmers and land managers, um across um England. There are seventeen suppliers um that are delivering uh, the support, and it was all competitively tendered for. Um, each region actually has um, a different range of suppliers and they all offer something a little bit different as well. So some um, suppliers focus on, on specific regions and regional um, uh, issues and sectors. Um, some offer a wide variety of support um, and others just do tailored one-to-one -one support. So it might be that you pick a provider uh, based on what you actually want to get from it because they're all slightly different. Um, but it's important to add that each SBI number can only receive support from one of the uh, Future Farmer Resilience Fund suppliers. So if you have already received the support from another supplier, you would not be able to join the Ricardo one. Um, and that, that details, those details go through to DEFRA at the sign up and the SBI details are checked by them. So it's only available once. So next slide, please, Laura. So the eligibility to be able to sign up to Future Farmer Resilience Fund is that you must have been claiming under basic payment scheme or higher level stewardship. Anyone that is doing that within the farming sector, any size, um, any farming business is able to sign up to it. And as I've mentioned, it is available across all of the regions in England as well. So next slide, please, Laura. So what does the Ricardo Future Farm and Resilience Fund um, project offer? Um, so the tailored uh, project from Ricardo offers uh, business resilience reviews. So there was budget to deliver 600 on-farm visits. I know that they are nearing the capacity for those visits. And what you would get from, from an on-farm business resilience review um, is up to three days of time with an Anderson's advisor. So I know that Amelia has been delivering some of those for us. Um, it would depend who is operating in your region for Anderson's, who would come to the farm. That would involve them coming onto your farm um, and sitting down with you one-to-one, -one, um, doing visits, having a chat with you, going through various um, options. As you can see there on the right of the screen, it's looking at a business review, it can look at debt restructuring, diversification, if you're thinking of going down that route, budgeting, all manner of business um, options are available there. Then the advisor would write up a report, um, with, which includes an action plan as well for you to be able to take away and then look at to implement. So that in itself has a very high value that is um, out there on offer to you. So next slide, please, Laura. So as mentioned, it's open to any um, size farm sector and location. And so all the all take up so far, we've seen that across the board. Um, the average annual increase in profitability as a result of having this review has been 57,549 pounds. The feedback's been really positive over what's been delivered. So 98% of feedback respondents said the advisor's working practices and the quality of the advice was excellent or good. And 84% have said that they would implement the recommended actions. And in a great show of feedback, 100% would recommend the service to other farmers as well. So next slide, please, Laura. Thank you. The other aspect of Ricardo's Future Farm Resilience Fund offer is the environmental sustainability reviews. 
So there's budget to deliver 300 of these and we've actually gone over that target. They've been extremely popular. So they are currently offering some more out there um, and they're done on a first come first serve basis as well. So this is a day's worth of time with an agri-environment advisor who would be regional to you. And this time involves, again, the preparation um, of visits, the actual visit itself, which is done on a one-to-one -one, um, at your home and your farm. Then you would be receiving a report and an action plan again to implement. So this visit um, is where you could explore, um, obviously Countryside Stewardship is actually now, well, mid-tier has now gone into sustainable farming incentive. So it might be that you want to look at the SFI further and the other grants and schemes that Amelia has just covered on in her presentation. It could be that you want to look at pollution prevention or even energy and heat as well and renewables and things like that. But the bulk of this has been looking at sort of SFI and grant options. Next slide, please, Laura. Again, a um, wide variety of take up from uh, various sectors within farming. And 100% of feedback has said that the advisor's work in practice is good. And 94% uh, said the quality of the advice was excellent or good as well. 97% have stated that they would implement all the recommended actions and that they would recommend it to other farmers as well. So that's just been quite popular given the change in environment of what's been going on with uh, the offer for SFI as well. Um, next slide, please, Laura. So there's also um, become available follow-up support. So people that have had the business resilience reviews or the environmental reviews um, are able to access follow-up support. So that's eight hours worth of additional support um, to look into um, the, the report more in depth, ask any more questions you may have or explore some of the options or queries. Um, so the feedback, this came about because the feedback from the initial phases was that um, it would help um, farmers in implementing what they'd learned from those visits as well. Um, there's also support available through a uh, farming community network who are a partner of our project as well. So that's also um, looking at well-being um, and health and um, other sort of advice that might be out there too. So the next slide, please, Laura. So the follow-up support, um, I think this is a, the 229 is a little bit outdated now. Um, and we have had some more people sign up to follow-ups um, since I did produce this presentation. Um, and it's ongoing that people who have had the initial support, the team do follow up with those people to see if they require that additional eight hours. So it's quite proactive um, and people will ask you if you would like that. And again, the feedback that's really positive that 97 percent have rated it as um excellent or good so that's good to know and the next slide please laura in addition um to the um one-to-one -one advice sessions and um, just to say that if you sign up you don't have to take both advice sessions the business and the environmental you can sign up and just take one of them but of course you are entitled to both as well if you feel that's what you need um but on top of the one-to-one -one visits and um, we have run some workshops within the regions so in Yorkshire we've done a, a couple of sessions looking at SFI they were in-person workshops um, Amelia came and delivered for us and um, they were very popular and we tend to do these workshops as and when we feel there's something topical to do in person um, because sometimes that's more handier than doing uh, just doing them over a webinar and you can get to um, access a wide variety of speakers. At the moment, there isn't anything um, on the cards, I think, at the minute in this region, but um, if there is, it will be um, readily available on the FFRF website. We've also done webinars as well um, on the topics. Uh, so sometimes it's just been on some of the grant topics. It, we've done them on... Um, uh, inheritance as well and sometimes they are web there are webinars that follow up or complement the in-person workshops so if you're unable to come along to an in-person workshop um, then you can obviously join in on a webinar which is easier for some people um, also on the website and um, there's a toolbox with loads of information on there um, and there's also some a podcast series as well that you can listen to in your own time as well so it's quite a, a 
range of resources on that website. Next slide, please, Laura. So um, how you can sign up for the Future Farmer Resilience Fund, as Amelia said, it is only running now until um, March 2025, and we don't know what will happen uh, beyond March 2025, but there is still the opportunity to take advantage of it. So you can visit the website ffrf.ricardo.com where you can enter your details or send an email to the team at ffrf at ricardo.com. And you can just telephone them and request to sign up as well. And as we're not in person, I don't have contact cards to hand, but we do take them to different events. And the next slide, please, Laura. So as previously mentioned, Farming Community Network, the charity um, are a partner of ours. Um, if um, you feel that you need some help that's maybe not covered by Future Farming Resilience Fund, um, you are always able to contact them and they will be able to then seek you the right help or support as well. And the next slide, please, Laura. And that's all from me. We've covered everything, I believe, unless anyone has any questions. That was my very brief presentation on FFRF. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Amanda. Not a question, but someone has raised a useful point in the Q&A, which, as you mentioned, there are 17 different providers and each of their offers looks slightly different, including the amount mm. of time that is on offer. So my understanding is that the Ricardo offer is quite generous in terms of the three days plus follow-up plus um, mm. environmental visit. Uh, because of, if we want to be uh, fair, the other providers are available and encourage people to check out the other options, but just to make mm -hmm. you aware that, um, yeah, you're looking at different deals. Essentially, it's like uh, yeah. shopping for broadband and can consider the various different options yeah. available across the country. It's like some some of the providers are maybe focused a bit more on like, you know, the, the carbon auditing side of things and 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 that sort of route as well, which might be of more interest to some people. So it is definitely worth looking at the um, the providers that are operating in your region, because it might be that there's something really specific that you want, and one of those providers might be offering that. The other thing I just wanted to pick up on before handing over to Graham, which is something that you mentioned in your slides, uh, but skipped over because you were covering lots of data. The average annual profit increase for someone who's had a review, fifty-seven and a half thousand pounds. Like that's yeah, that's it, significant. Was it? Yeah, yeah. So once they've received the report and then implemented it, and obviously it's up to the up to the person receiving that report to do that work um, and take that advice, isn't it? Um, but yes, it's it's helping people obviously um, make the most of what they've got and increase those uh, turnovers. Yeah. Yeah, so that's twice the um, living wage salary in a year for different uh, lifestyles and living costs. But yeah, I don't think it's not uh, it's not a small number. So I just wanted to pick up on that mm. uh, within a lot of in other information. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. As I said, uh, we will send around links to the various different uh, bits and pieces that have been covered today, including links where you can um, access the kind of next steps if this is something that you would like to explore. I will close my screen so that, uh, Graham, if you would like to yep. uh, take control. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you loud and clear, thank you. Jolly good. Now, I just need to get the right screen. Can everybody, let me try that one, share that one, and hopefully do that. Right, can everybody see that? That looks good. Thank you very much. Awesome. Great. I finally remembered how to do Zoom when I use it once a year. Anyway, <laughs> morning, everybody. Uh, just uh, Graham Dix here from uh, Environment Agency based in Nottingham. I'm the Senior Environment Officer for Agriculture in our East Midlands area. Um, so what to expect today? So I'm going to do uh, a quick couple of slides on uh, some latest info on groundwater quality and nitrates. And then I'm going to talk mostly about tackling diffuse pollution, um, farming rules for water, the eight rules. I'll be concentrating on rule one, planning, Secretary of State's guidance that came out a couple of years ago. And finish off with rule four, six and seven, which are the most sort of pertinent ones. So groundwater, um, obviously 
one of the reasons why we're having these meetings uh, is the Solby and Doncaster groundwater fields uh, and Yorkshire waters boreholes. Um, just uh, pulled some current data um, of our system, national system. Um, I think it uh, highlights quite nicely the, the sort of role and the problem we've got with groundwater quality. Uh, it's a big battle and it's a long battle. Um, if I can just draw your attention to the three pie charts just at the top left there. So under the Water Framework Directive, we have to get all water bodies, be they groundwater or surface water, to good good status. Um, there are certain dates for that, most of which are, we're going to struggle with due to funding and various other reasons of global issues, et cetera, et cetera, which I don't talk about today. But if we just have a look at these these three pie charts, so back in 2009, just before the, the, um, the big financial crash, Nearly 60% of our groundwater bodies in England were at good chemical status, which was good. If we fast forward to the right hand uh, pie chart, unfortunately, we can see that we're down to only about 45% now based on our latest data two years ago. So um, slightly worrying trend. And if we have a look at the table at the bottom left, uh, where the trends are going specifically due to nitrates, then we can see that um, there's some issues there and we're increasingly getting failures of water, groundwater bodies, chemical status because of nitrates. And this, uh, I think, illustrates it very well in terms of where nitrate sits in the hierarchy of substances that are causing failures for groundwater. Um, based on water framework directive monitoring. So uh, along the left-hand side, we've got all the substances here. And on the bottom of this graph, we've got the number of groundwater bodies failing. And if we look here at the top, nitrate, there's 108 water bodies failing drinking water standards for nitrate. The next nearest uh, pollutant, organophosphate, is affecting 36 water bodies, some of those that are also affected by nitrates um, but nitrates the big one and that's why we need to look at how we can reduce the impact going forward so groundwater has a chance to recover it does take a long time though in terms of sort of pollution prevention uh, and guidance uh, in terms of diffuse uh, pollution uh, I just wanted to really focus on that today bring some of you up to speed who aren't particularly aware of the farm rules for water um, or need a bit of a refresher on it or maybe you've not even heard of it yet. So this was uh, the actual law as written. Um, the actual legislation is called the Reduction and Prevention of Agricultural Diffuse Pollution England Regulations 2018, which is an absolute mouthful for anyone. So uh, we came up with a better idea, did DEFRA, and call it Farming Rules for Water. So you might be more familiar with that uh, that banner there. Um, so it's eight rules, and um, they're generally pretty uh, straightforward, to be fair. So 2018, these rules were laid and became uh, law quite a long time ago, keep calling them new rules, they're not really, six years. So there's eight rules based on best practice. And these have been designed to promote good practice in managing your fertilisers and manures, and that can also include things like anaerobic digestate and compost. To get the full value out of those, the nutrient benefit to, to your soils and your crops, and not waste money importantly to also encourage yourselves to take reasonable precautions to prevent diffuse pollution from runoff or soil erosion which again is soils coming up the agenda now as well and to protect and improve the water quality and that might be surface water or groundwater and the environment as a whole but also what one the defra wanted was the rules to be simple and aligned with existing rules and just just finally they they also need to be proportionate, practical and reasonable, which I think in the main they are. So those are, those are the eight rules. Um, that's the back of the cab card. So I'm just going to concentrate on some of the probably more important ones that you need to be thinking about. So, but first, what's, what's different about these rules to other rules that you might have to adhere to? So these, these are designed to address diffuse pollution 
in a proportionate and collaborative way. So it's not just a bunch of rules saying you've got to do this, that and the other. They've been drawn up actually with the farming community, the NFU, other trade bodies, um, so that we could come up with some practical risk-based um, rules that will help you prevent and reduce agricultural pollution now and in the future. So they also include some new concepts such as reasonable precautions, which encourage yourselves to come up with the best solutions to stop any pollution occurring or to reduce it through whatever you might be doing on the land, be it cultivation, harvesting, uh, etc., or spreading. Um, basically, we want you to keep your valuable topsoil where it is because that's what makes uh, crops grow, animal feed, and you hopefully turn a bit of profit and also to apply fertilizers only where and when appropriate so again we're talking a lot about not not wasting money here for yourselves and saving money in terms of enforcement um we we are charged with reg regulating the rules we don't write the rules defra write the rules and the secretary of state signs those rules but in those rules and regulations um it cites as as the enforcement body so our job is to regulate the rules how we do that is part of our existing program of work which is planned farm inspections and we do it in line with our enforcement and sanctions policy which covers all manner of the work the environment agency does in, in a re regulatory setting and we're doing it through an ad advice-led approach using our existing enforcement tools so there's nothing new here really so the main push is to use advice and guidance and I encourage people to come and talk to us so we can give that advice and guidance. If that fails, we have also got uh, a next tier of, of uh, enforcement, which is just above the bottom tier, which, which is a site warnings. Above that, we've got something called civil sanctions, which are basically monetary penalties. And if all else fails, all there's major pollution occurring, um, then we have the options to use the prosecution route, which we do as a last resort. Uh, we prefer to use advice and guidance and some of the other uh, options available. Um, so just looking at rule one then. So planning use of manures and fertilisers. So again, a lot of this is going to be no new news to you guys. So application of organic manures and manufactured fertilisers to cultivated land must be planned in advance to meet soil and crop nutrient needs and not exceed those levels. And again, you've probably heard of this in the MVZ rules, really, but it kind of makes sense. And if we're looking at what comes out your wallet or goes into your wallet, it's all about saving and looking after your money as well. So the planning must take into account any significant risk of pollution that may occur from any actions you're doing and the results of testing. So we're looking at phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, pH, which of course is very important in your soils and nitrogen levels. One new rule that's come in that's not been in any of the previous rules or regulations is now it's law that you must test your soils every five years at least. And We've had some good speakers already on talking about sustainable farm initiative incentive. Sorry. So there is some money available, quite a lot chunk of money available to help you with your soil testing. So good nutrient planning is key to maximising your nutrient and crop efficiency, managing your costs and reducing pollution. It's not a new concept. And if you just have a look at the bottom of this slide, I know it's a bit small, small print, but. The first version of the Code of Good Agricultural Practice that was published back in 1985 talks about these very same things. So it's, this is not a new new concept for anyone. And in MVZ areas, we've already got the four stage nutrient plan for nitrogen, risk maps and recognised planning tools available to help you do your nutrient planning already. We've now got the farming rules on top of that. And if you're in a non MVZ area, you have this rules these rules to fall back on now as well as good practice guidance so what also is key to nutrient good nutrient planning is good soil management and good soil health 
again, the better the health of your soils, the better your crops are going to be. It requires good and careful planning and the application of those plans when you actually get into the field. As I said, there's some generous SFI money out there, so it's worth investigating that. And there's some good folks on this on this call today to help you with that. There are also many ta ta tools available uh, to help you with your planning, most of which you probably have heard of before. So there's MANA NPK, um, which helps you through various different scenarios of application rates. There's also the Nutrient Management Guide RB209 books, six of those, I think, off the top of my head. They're currently in a review and re rewrite, rewrite, I can't say it, rewrite stage. So there's going to be some new new copies of that coming with up-to-date data in the near future. Really good back books to get your head around. And there's also Planet, which isn't available at the moment, but it's uh, being rewritten and uh, pulled, re-pulled together at the moment, which again uses the RB209 data. So that, that's been adapted to take into changes in farming practice and regulations. So that'd be a good tool. And, and also there's the Nutrient Management Planning Booklet, um, which is done by Tried and Tested, which is uh, readily available via whichever uh, platform you wish to use on the internet. Great little books. Um, in terms of Rule 1, there was something called the Statutory Secretary of State's Guidance, um, which was applied to the agency, but also farmers and advisors could look at and use. Um, there's been some significant changes with that this year. So um, there was a judicial review brought against the agency regarding the farming rules for water. So River Action challenged us uh, and they were given permission um, to challenge us in the High Court, specifically around how we were enforcing Rule 1, which is actually Regulation 4 in the actual rules, um, on the grounds that we had adopted an approach contrary to the legislation which set out how we should regulate those rules. And we'd unlawfully fettered our discretion, or in other words, watered down how we actually enforce the rules by following the Secretary of State statutory guidance that was published March 2022. So the rulings being done and dusted, um, and the judge actually found that the role of the statutory guidance had not led us to water down our approach um, to enforcement. Um, the difference in interpretation had not assisted our enforcement activities We'd actually demonstrate through our policies and procedures lawful compliance with farming rules for water. And I spent two very enjoyable days redacting the huge amount of paperwork that went into um, our case with our barrister to show just exactly what we were doing on, on the ground. Significantly, the judge also found in favour of ourselves and River Actions um, interpretation at the time of application of um, manures and fertilisers is what matters rather than considering crop or soil need over a cycle or rotation. And that was to avoid over application. So it's, it's really important that you, you only apply what the f crop needs that's actually going to be going into the ground or is in the ground and not thinking of two or three crops ahead. Because most of what you put on is going to disappear. So you've wasted your money and you probably cause some sort of pollution. So don't do it. So the impact is that the judgment has all endorsed how we're doing our regulation enforcement. Um, we still have to take into account the Secretary of State's guidance where farmers and agronomists are actually using that to justify some of what they're doing. Um, and the third point is the um, Office of Environmental Protection is actually investigating the guidance at the moment. So we're just waiting to find out what um, the Office of Environment Protection comes back with that. Um, the actual guidance is due for review in 2025 anyway. Um, we have had some political changes, if you if you haven't noticed. So it, that might come sooner or later. I, I don't know at the moment. One to look out for, though. Right, so rule three, applying manures and fertilisers. So they must not be applied if the soil is waterlogged, flooded or snow covered, 
if the soil has been hard frozen for more than 12 hours in the previous 24, and if there's significant risk of causing pollution. So the first two points are nothing new. They've been in the Code of Good Ethical Practices for 30, 30 odd years, as well as the MVZ rules. In terms of where not to apply organic manures, so they must not be applied within 10 metres of, of any inland fresh water or coastal waters, or if you're using precision equipment within six metres. So again, that's in line with MVZ regulations. And the same with springs, wells or boreholes, it's 50 metres. And that includes anyone outside your land that might be within 50 metres of where you're spreading. So just you have to bear in mind any neighbourly well springs or boreholes. Rule six. Reasonable cautions preventing soil erosion. So this is this is a new one. Uh, it's something we've been waiting for for a long time. There's some, some horrendous pictures of what happens when it goes wrong. So you must take all reasonable precautions to pretend, prevent significant soil erosion and runoff from the application of your organic manures and manufactured fertilisers. Land management and cultivation practices. So that includes your seed beds, tram lines and rows, beds and stubbles, including harvested land with horn, uh, poly polytunnels, which are not so much around here, and irrigation, which, of course, if that's not being regularly monitored, can cause issues. And poaching by livestock, which can still be quite a big problem. And just moving on to that. For anyone who has got livestock on the call, rule seven. So this is protecting soil erosion from livestock. So any land within five metres of inland fresh waters or coastal waters must be protected from significant soil erosion by preventing poaching by livestock. So the rules sort of talk about anything greater than one square kilometre in general in the field, but along water courses, ditches, etc., um, significant um, soil erosion through poaching is anything from a stretch of 20, 20 metres along a stretch of water course by two metres out from the bank. So um, that's the sort of things you need to be looking out for and you need to maybe thinking about putting some fencing in. And again, there's money to help with that generally. Um, so that's a quick fly through. Thanks for listening. Um, just a quick update that there is going to be some new agency guidance coming out soon with a a very catchy uh, or corny um, title, Harvesting Success, Pollution Prevention Rules for Farmers. So that's pulling all the pollution prevention rules together into one document. So hopefully that will be um, published in the very near future. Uh, so look out for that. It should be on gov.uk. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I feel like the session today has uh, bookmarked the uh, importance of what we're talking about in terms of nutrient and pesticide use and the impact both from a business perspective and environmental perspective on keeping that out of the water. Um, and then hopefully the sessions in the middle have given people some uh, useful content in terms of what their options are for the next steps if they uh, would like to access some of the resources that are available to support. So we've covered a fair amount. Thank you very much, everybody, for your patience. I'm just having a look, and there's nothing further in the Q&A. So unless anything pops up in the next minute or so, I will just close things off by saying thank you very much for your time, both those attending and also to Paul, Amelia, Amanda, and Graham for your time and expertise today. As I mentioned, we will send a follow-up email in the next couple of days, which will give a link to this recording. Please do feel free to share it with anyone you think might be interested, as well as uh, links to some of the useful pages and resources that have been mentioned in today's sessions. We will also, in that email, ask you for some feedback on today's session. If you could just spend less than five minutes giving us your opinion on how this has gone and how we might be able to approach uh, future sessions to make them useful and interesting. That will be really appreciated. And if there's nothing else from any of our other speakers, I will just pause to give you opportunity. I will bring things to a close. Thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Mike.